Hello everybody, welcome to this. It's the continuation in the series on The Great Gatsby. Everything I go through in this video series comes from Mr. Bros' Guide to The Great Gatsby, written by Miss Hallahan, available in paperback on Amazon, Kindle version on Amazon, ebook at mrbruff.com. Today I'm going to talk about Fitzgerald's use of themes, starting with the theme of the American dream. We originally think of the American dream perhaps as this idea that anybody can succeed if they work hard enough. Class distinctions will not hold them back. Over time, however, it's come to mean the obtaining of material possessions that in themselves are signs of wealth and affluence. Money in this novel can be split into old and new, perhaps best demonstrated by Gatsby and Tom. Gatsby is this self-made man. Uh, he's uh, firmly in the new camp. Now, in the 1920s, social mobility permitted the working classes to acquire money at a rate never before known. And this disruption to the social classes was met with mixed reactions. Some resented the apparent appearance of respectability in the newcomers. Um, some felt this was the embodiment of the American dream and that money, old and new, should be valued the same. Old money was considered more respectable because it was acquired through the nobility of birth. Land was inherited. There were expectations regarding the level of education received. Control over marriages was commonplace. The old money had a veneer of respectability, with the manners of the old world society dictating etiquette that Gatsby hopelessly fails to grasp. An example of this, obviously, is when the Sloanes invite Gatsby to come to their party with absolute insincerity. Mrs Sloane invites Gatsby enthusiastically and tells him she means it, but Tom contradicts this when he says to Nick she doesn't want him. They invite him, expecting him to decline, and this complicated charade of saying the opposite to what you mean in order to be polite mystifies Gatsby. And although Nick, having been brought up among these people with his own family described as prominent well-to-do, can pick up on these cues, Gatsby says the wrong thing and is then sneered at by his own guests. Fitzgerald depicts this exchange in a way that leads the reader to sympathise with Gatsby rather than sneer at him with the Sloanes. Just, just as Gatsby arrives on the steps, the Sloanes exchange a cool nod before they trotted off, uh, trotted quickly away. And this... Um, image of Gatsby standing on the steps of his grand house, watching on in futility as his invitation and opportunity to spend more time with the husband of his lover slip away down his own drive, makes us feel sorry for him. It occurs just after we hear the story of Gatsby's humble beginnings, and before the second party, where the behaviour of the party guests are perceived by Nick to be septic. So through this structural placement of this moment, Fitzgerald encourages the reader to view Gatsby as an innocent, unblemished by the corruption of old money, and simple in his adherence to the basic rules of hospitality. For example, his unease until he's provided drinks for his guests at the beginning of the encounter contrasts with the way his guests sneer at his misunderstanding at the end. The eyes of Dr. T. J. Eckelberg, the eyes of God, uh, owned by Dr. T.J. Eckelberg, who overlook the ash heaps, view the worst behaviour of the characters. When Tom goes to the garage to insult his mistress's husband and then sneak her away for an afternoon of extramarital seediness, it is seen by Eckelberg. Uh, when Gatsby and Daisy plough into Myrtle and leave her dead body in the dust, Eckelberg sees it. In the Valley of Ash that lay halfway between West Egg and New York, the desolate land grows ashes instead of wheat in grotesque gardens, in a kind of reverse garden of Eden. Like Adam and Eve, George and Myrtle are childless and the woman is the sinner. Uh, of course, uh, Adam and Eve went on to have children, but like that initial idea. Uh, in the Garden of Eden. Fitzgerald subverts the Bible story by casting the pair out, not to go and work in the world, but killing them off instead. This is not a forgiving God uh, like the one we see in the Bible. The billboard is an old advertisement for an opticians that is now long gone, and if God is advertising, then logic follows that for Gatsby and his friends, their religion is capitalism. The advertisement is first referenced in chapter 2, when Nick and Tom go to New York, and Tom literally forced Nick to meet Myrtle. Its irises are one yard high, the description says, and they brood on over the solemn dumping ground. 
Through Fitzgerald's characterization of this advert as a voyeur of the valley, Fitzgerald conveys the idea that the eyes are taking in the behaviour of all those below and judging those who partake in untoward activity, much like how we might think of a, a god figure or a judge. Uh, later, in Chapter 7, Nick sees Dr. T.J. Eckleberg's faded eyes, and they remind him of Gatsby's caution about gasoline. Had Nick not told Tom to stop, then Myrtle would never have seen Tom in the car, and she would never have attempted to stop the car later when Daisy drove the car home. When a grief-stricken George tells Michaelis that God sees everything, uh, Michaelis corrects him. That's an advertisement. And this assurance serves to reveal the way Fitzgerald has depicted the society as godless and lost. Michaelis' conversation follows an exchange about George and Myrtle's church attendance and how uh, we read that um, Michaelis tells George, you ought to have a church, you must have a church. And Fitzgerald highlights the break between the church and the American people. In the 1920s, church attendance by men in particular had dropped, and Fitzgerald's use of the advertisement as a substitute for God questions the direction America has taken as religious faith diminished. Finally, let's look at the acquisition of money and the American dream. Nick works with bonds, we know that. Tom and Daisy come from money. Jordan has financial success with her golfing career, something that someone with her wealthy background could pursue because of the freedom money allows. Yet all of them, with the exception of Nick, have some connection with corruption. Gatsby's illegal business deals, Tom's own behaviour in Chicago, his friend who foul, fell foul of Gatsby and Wolfsheim, uh, Jordan's deceit in a golf match that she cheated at, uh, Nick himself is involved in some duplicity, but this is not money orientated. And when Gatsby offers him an opportunity to make some money, Nick declines, seeing the offer as tactlessly offered in exchange for Nick's help. In this way, Fitzgerald sets Nick apart from the others and adds to the sense of an outsider that surrounds Nick. However, Nick does concede that if this happened at another point, it would be one of the crises of my life. Fitzgerald splinters Nick's morality. He rejects the offer, but hints at a time when he may have been tempted. Yes, he does ultimately turn it down, but Fitzgerald is further undermining Nick's claim to be honest and critiquing the old money values that pervaded society. Daisy's appeals to Gatsby is also money orientated. The green light on the dock that encapsulates Gatsby's longing for his wartime sweetheart can be seen as the symbol for the money that Daisy represents for Gatsby. The money Gatsby makes is not even accepted by the high society guests. Tom and the Sloanes and the guests uh, that Nick notes become brave on Gatsby's liquor and use that courage to make derisory comments about their host. It wouldn't matter how much money Gatsby made because the money is green and uh, the money is new. Um, Tom and Daisy are repeatedly described using gold, whereas Gatsby using green imagery represents the new money that will never match up to the old money that society respects so much. In Chapter 1, the home of the Buchanans is described as glowing now with reflected gold, and in Chapter 7, Nick considers how Daisy is the golden girl with a voice that was full of money. So I hope you found this video useful. Please do give it a thumbs up and do pick up a copy of Mr. Bruff's Guide to the Great Gatsby. I'll be making a few videos on this text, but not everything at all that's in the book. So please do go and pick up a copy today.